All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here at Adia Wine Company with Ann and Dean Fisher. Yeah, it's August 1st, 2019. Uh, thank you both so much for joining us today. We really appreciate yeah, absolutely. this. Thank you. For your hospitality here. Um, let me start by asking you, why wine? Why wine? Interesting question. We got started in the wine industry basically as a hobby. Um, we, we, uh, Ann was in the financial business and prior to that we lived in Portland and we uh, found this piece of property out here and bought it uh, in 1983. We moved in in 84. January 1st. January 1st. What a disaster. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> got to, but we got didn't to, move out here. Yeah. We hadn't found Pinot Noir by that time. No. Yeah. Um, Not really. It was after you started doing some fabrication yeah. for Ponzi and Chateau Benoit and... A bunch of Dickie yeah. Raff. Yes. Yeah. Well, we, we started out originally when, when we first bought this place. Um, I was working for a, an equipment company in Tigard, Oregon, mm -hmm. utility equipment, building custom trucks uh, for the power industry. Mm -hmm. And after a couple of years of the transport, you know, the commute, I decided uh, why not to start my own company. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I did. I started aerial equipment um, specialist, and I built trucks for Portland General Electric was basically my biggest customer. But uh, West Oregon Electric, all the little PUDs and co ops and Bonneville Power, even. But, um, and that went on for quite a few years, and, and uh, we bought this place and, uh, um, and got pregnant with Adam. <laughs> and so we put another uh, mobile home in here, and uh, it had a little single wide when we bought this place. It's 20, just 22 acres, and it's not really. Um, designed or, or perfect for grape growing, uh, this property isn't. Yeah, it's more well, timber. The first grapes were planted more for landscaping and keeping um, the weeds at bay <laughs> yeah. for his allergies. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that, that was in 1990. We planted those, and they they were actually uh, plants that Mike Getzel had left over from the Pearl Fair when he was planting it, and so he helped me. We planted that vineyard. Uh, in 1990. That's Permard, it's on its own route, mm -hmm. it's dry farmed. Uh, and it was basically perfect for a hobby. Um, you know, it's a the 300 gallon, or is it 200, 200 gallons? I can't remember. It was perfect for that. Uh, we cropped it really low yields, and made some really nice wines off it. And, uh, and of course, we didn't start getting fruit till 93 or 4. It was 94 when we first, uh, um, the first fruit mm -hmm. that we processed. We processed that at Bikes, didn't we? Yeah. We, that was made at Brofair. But uh, prior to that, uh, Mike and I had uh, worked together for, he worked here in the wintertime at Ariel, and, and uh, uh, in summer he'd work in his vineyard. And uh, so we started, uh, I was building something for Dick Ponzi at the time, and Mike was selling fruit to, to Dick. And so we talked Dick into letting us make the wine at his place. So that was the first, the first uh, I guess, it was Dino's Pinot Bootleg Vino <coughs> back then. And, uh, and so we made wine for three or four years off of Michael's vineyard. And, uh, and then we, uh, and then Michael talked Robert Parker into uh, mm -hmm. uh, go ahead and start the winery, mm -hmm. and that's that's when Brofair started. But we've been wine at, at Michael's for quite a few years, even after uh, Eric Homaker had come up, and um, Eric was dating Louisa, Dick's daughter, and uh, we uh, uh, Dick introduced me to Eric. And um, and Eric was talking with Hal Medici about starting <coughs> the Medici winery, and so we, Eric and I, uh, got together and and uh, I built the sorting line. Uh, the first sorting line that I built was in was Michael's, and the house was the second. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And now there's. 
20 of them. 20, 21, 21, 22 sorting lines in the valley that I've built. <laughs> Bergstrom has one. Uh, Freya, Coleman. Kramer. Kramer. Coella. Coella. Hamina. Yeah. Wow. Carbowell Hill down in Floma. Mm -hmm. yeah. They've got one. Uh, I'm trying to think who Iota had Iota Sellers. Uh, Scott Paul had one. Mm-hmm. Which I built for Kelly. Mm -hmm. uh, Fox, uh, when she was working with Scott Paul. And uh, anyway, so they, this, this. Tendril. Kid, Tendril. Yeah, he has one. But uh, I don't know. It was, it was a fun project. But so it, it happened, in, I think, in 1993. Uh, when Keith Orr broke his leg? I think so. Yeah, well, he, was, he was buying fruit from Whistling Ridge. Mm -hmm. And so, um, anyway, we scrounged around. Uh, he, he wasn't able to make wine that year, and so we, we uh, uh, worked with the Alports to uh, make some wine and uh, realized that we were making more than we should. <laughs> and. Uh, Got her license. <laughs> like for her license. <laughs> That's how. And our original label was Fisher Family Cellars. Uh, was the original label. And in, in 1999, we ordered the foils for the 97 vintage. Um, and Robin sent them to Fisher Vineyards of California. And they called us and told us they had an international trademark and da 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 da. So. We went back and forth on that for a little bit and decided to change the name <laughs> to, to a Well, they were good oh, about it. They, they really said, good use up yeah. everything you have, but then don't make Fisher the, yeah, the right. focal point. Mm -hmm. So we changed the, the name to Adia, which is an acronym for our family. It's Anne, Dean, Erica, and Adam. And uh, yeah, that was 1998 was the first release of Adia. Yes. Yeah. Tell me about going from planting a vineyard just as kind of a hobby to actually like deciding this is what you wanted to do. Like, was there a, a moment where you decided winemaking was the thing you wanted to do in wine business? <laughs> Interesting story there, and a whole another one. Uh, aerial equipment, of course, was building roughly 40 trucks a year for Portland General Electric, um, and Enron came into the picture. Hmm. And Enron pulled everything in-house at the time. And we know what happened with Enron. Hmm. And it was about that time that we just decided, well, you know, it's a good time. We've been doing this for 15 years or so, and it was a good time to step out and swap the duties. Hmm. So Adia became the primary thing, and Aerial Equipment was still building sorting lines and stuff for uh, the wine industry. But we were making wine, uh, interestingly enough, we made, it was funny, we would leave here and go over to Michael's and for the fermenters coming off the Whistling Ridge uh, Vineyard mm -hmm. and here. And then I'd go down to uh, Hal Medici's and do my punch downs and stuff for the fruit coming out of Yamhill and Coleman. That Vineyard. was 95, 6, 7. 6, 7. 1998. And eight. And eight. eight was the last year we were at Medici's. And um, we were going to move the winery home here. And that's when all this had gone down. Mm -hmm. This kind of stuff was. Mm -hmm. And um, Eric Limelson, uh, mm -hmm. Eric Homaker was helping uh, Eric do, Limelson do the uh, design for his new winery mm -hmm. that he was building in 1998, 99. So the first year of Limelson was 1999, and Eric invited me to come help him work the bugs out of his winery, right? So I went over, and we were at Limelson's 99, 2000, 2001, mm -hmm. and then we moved the winery home in 2002. And at the same time, we, we uh, started doing alternating premise. 2000 was when we got our... Or was it? Well, when when the state applied. finally oh. said, "Okay, <laughs> you can right. have multiple wineries and do the alternating premise," well, and we, we Eric Comaker to, was really yeah. instrumental in yeah. that. Eric was instrumental in changing because before they didn't allow for an alternating premise. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, we we. Uh, 
moved the winery here uh, in 2002. We and had custom crush people. Had, had custom crush people. I remember Chris was here and Roots, Roots, and, uh, um, Kinsella, Kinsella. Marcus Goodfellow. Was well, he? Marcus oh, and Bishop was here. Antica Terra and uh, Ruby Carbonero. Yeah, forgot about him. That's what Roots. That's what Chris was doing was <laughs> Ruby Carbonero. And, and when yeah. they left, then Antica Terra was here for a couple. Well three and four, yeah. five. And then in six, Bishop Creek and Matello, which is now Goodfellow, mm -hmm. and... Um, Todd Hammond was here in Todd seven. Todd didn't come till 07. Yeah. And 12. Yeah. Don and Kinsella was still here. Yeah. yeah. Kinsella was still here. So there were five. We. Yeah. It was the Gaston, Gaston five, five for a while. until Todd came in. It was Gaston six. <laughs> <laughs> we we'd have winemaker dinners or guest chef dinners at that. I guess at that time, we guest chef dinners, and so we would all pour a different course, mm -hmm. and then the main course, we'd all put a bottle of Pinot on the table. So there was eight people to a table. Yeah, and six bottles of wine. And six bottles of wine. <laughs> it was a uh, yeah. We had to curbed that whole thing a little bit because it got pretty wild. But uh, uh, the thing that I was thinking about was the process that we went through to get the winery license here because we're in an AF10 zoning mm -hmm. and at the time they did not allow for a winery in an AF10 zoning, mm -hmm. at least in Yano County. And so we had to go through a huge process to get that done and actually change the zoning for this piece of property to an RI, resource industrial, in order to do the winery. And shortly thereafter, was a year or less after that, they finally decided that they would you allow could do a conditional, uh, use conditional use permit for a winery in the AF10 zoning. But it was a big deal. And we had county commissioners involved and everything else to get this whole thing done. Uh, it, was, it was quite the process. Uh, but it all, it all did work out, except for it changed the zoning of a big chunk of this property. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this property. Uh, you mentioned you purchased it in 1990. What 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 drew you to this property, and, and what what have you kind of learned of the history of it? Well, well we purchased it um, in 1983. Oh, sorry, at the very beginning of '84. Right. Moved in in '84. Planted in '84. And um, and then when he was doing the fabricating for different wineries, making dumpers and things like that. Yeah. He was getting to taste Pinot Noir, and then we kind of fell in love with Pinot Noir. And That's then, where the bug bit us. And then, uh, yeah, so that was probably in '87. Yeah. And then we and then we met Michael, and he had the extra plants. We planted that stuff, and and it just it went from there. Um, so the property was not purchased for with right. the thought of vineyard. Ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just happenstance. And um, we <laughs> chunked off a five acre piece that when his brother moved up from California because the 20, almost 22 acres had been plotted in 1910, 10 or yeah, 12. 12, I think. And so we didn't have that limitation of only 10 acres or, mm -hmm. or five right. or something. Yeah, it was, it was, so it was already divided. divided. Yeah. So there was there was one, two, three, four lots on this twenty-two acres. Mm -hmm. My brother, we sold him the set. It was a five-acre lot, a little over five acres, uh, where Erica, our daughter, lives now. Um, uh, Randy passed a few years back, and uh, the house we built our house in '96 up on the hill, uh, and it was on a seven-acre parcel. And the winery's on almost six acres. And then there's the original home site, which is a one acre parcel, because that's how they kind of used to do it. And that's where the original vineyard is. Yeah, and that's where the, the old Pomar block is. So in 1999, we planted the upper block. Hmm. Um, because 
the fir trees and the emus and et cetera were, <laughs> were moved on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We got we, uh, Larry Crow talked us into buying some emus. This was oh my god. Oh, we've tried everything. Here, I thought, you were, here, I thought you were joking about emus. No, oh, no. it's serious. <laughs> yeah, we had emus no, here. And Next we, you know, we had like they 20 sold them, of them for the. Um, yeah. Oils they made. Yeah. There were lotions Jerky and, 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 and yes. stuff. <laughs> you know, it was it was quite the ordeal. Until uh, they, we had two left. We had actually they we had, laid eggs and yeah. some baby hats. Beautiful big, big green yeah. eggs. Yeah. It's like green eggs and ham. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, an entire what twelve egg omelet if you use one of them. <laughs> <laughs> They're huge. Yeah. We didn't. Uh, Eat them very often, but because um, we didn't want to crack the the green egg, they, they were so <laughs> pretty, you know. So you had to poke a hole in them with a little tiny drill and and break the yolk and get the stuff to come out. But, and, oh my God. and they, they were beautiful. We had we had them all over the place. And the <laughs> they don't taste like chicken, no. and they have to be marinated. I mean, not the eggs, but the meat. the meat. Yeah. It's kind of nasty. <laughs> But <laughs> we had a couple escape. <laughs> the, the last two that we had, the last pair, and somehow they wiggled around Any with shiny, the shiny left they, they clasp pick, on If you had a pin in your pocket, they'd pick the pin out. Okay. You know, or anything like that. It was shiny product. So they picked at the latch on the gate until the gate opened and finally they got the little clasp thing off and off they went. Yes. <laughs> Neighbors called us down over to Cove Orchard. <laughs> there were people calling all over the place. Trying to find out where they, they were. Came. They were walking up to houses, and <laughs> some lady called. She goes, "My kids just got home from school, and they're by themselves, and there's a bird at the back door, and, and they were afraid." And oh god. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh, yes. That was hilarious. <laughs> yes. But, uh, so, no more emus. <laughs> yes, we got rid of all our emus. Yeah. And if, there was a tree stand here. Now the original people that bought this, they had they had owned it since 1912, and that the parent blooms, and they um, had planted a, a tree farm, Christmas tree farm. And of course, by the time we bought the property, they were 20 feet tall, and they were planted fairly close together. So we had that we made the, we used them for the posts in the in the up there for the emus. So the emus were, had nice sheltered. <laughs> pins and all that stuff. Well, we had a real heavy snow that one year, and the outside row fell. And then the rest of the trees kind of went like dominoes. This was after the emus were gone. Yes. Yeah. So that's when we decided to plant that. We pulled all the trees up and all that stuff and planted them <laughs> on the upper vineyard. Right and those were Vadensville, no, 777. 777. And it was all grafted on 3309 rootstock, and we uh, acquired the plants from Mo Momtazi, where we bought fruit from as well, from Mo for quite a few years. So Col Coleman's out there and the Momtazi Coleman. So we uh, we used their fruit. Uh, nice fruit. We had the bee block up on top of the hill, and uh, oh, after a while, Mo decided he wanted that block for himself. <laughs> we were making some really nice wines. So. That's probably when we added the Cherry Grove Vineyard. Yeah, yeah we, pulled in, we pulled in Cherry Grove, which is a little further into the coast range, about six, seven miles from here, um, up towards the town of Cherry Grove. That's Cherry Grove Vineyard, but uh, really nice fruit there, 115, 777, mm -hmm. the two blocks that we had. There, Antique and Terra had a block up there, Chris Berg, and uh, Roshaw, I think, had one. and. I can't remember who all was yeah. in the buying fruit from, from uh, Bob von Steinberg. And then we had the Hawksview Vineyard. Hawksview Vineyard was the other one. Nice fruit, shale mountain stuff. I guess we had it before it was Hawksview. We had some Mirfield. Yeah, Mirfield. And Original, when originally we started with them, Bob Grimes was the vineyard manager and, and it was uh, Mirfield. And then uh, Jack Kemp that Ann knew well, he, she was uh, involved with uh, well, the Columbia management. Columbia management Company and was a VP, first woman. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, uh, 
anyway, we bought fruit from them. They changed the name to Hawks Field. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jack passed, and then AJ took it over, and uh, and now it's a new some new folks new in there, now, new owners now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But we we bought fruit from a, a lot of different people over the years. What did you find about this site for growing grapes, and what is it you look for when you're buying grapes from others? Well, soil's uh, a big part of it. Uh, we, we work with the Durants and the Dundee Hills for quite a few years uh, under their Red Ridge Farms. Uh, I made wine for them on a chair crop kind of a thing for quite a few years. Um, and, as, and as that kind of grew uh, with the uh, with their vineyard, they started having more and more people. I think Jesse Lang was doing Pinot Gris, and uh, uh, who else was? Joe Dobbs made a little wine off there, and, and Marcus Goodfellow. Um, Eric Comer was, was purchasing fruit, but they had people making wines for them, mm -hmm. for the Red Ridge Farm. Mm -hmm. And the only way you could tell the difference was by the BW number on the back of the label. Because it was the same label, mm -hmm. the BW number was the only thing that was different. So we did custom crush for them as well. We did quite a bit of custom crush work um, as well as alternating premise. And so we're, we're uh, now here with Kelly. Kelly's our newest tenant and, and Tebow, who was with, with Will Kenzie for 15 years, I think, until they sold to Jackson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's what we're doing. <laughs> Get, we're, we've downed our production quite a bit um, just because we're this is a comfort zone that we're in right now we, we do most of the wine we build right now is for for our wine club and uh, and right here at the bar at the premise mm -hmm. tell me what your what your winemaking philosophy is what do you want your wines to reflect what do you want people to get out of your wine well I Personally, I, I, I like it. I'm very, very uh, non-evasive uh, as far as the handling of the fruit. Mm -hmm. I want the fruit to express itself. And, and uh, you know, I, I, the balance, uh, we've got, I do single vineyards for the people that I buy food from. I'll do a single vineyard for them. And then I do a, one called Dino's. Uh, Dino's Pinot, and then that's a barrel selection of the cellar, and that's for my pal. That's for me. Uh, I did one for Ann too. Did Ann Sigrid for many years, and she says, uh, "I need to retire. You know, you're, you're, you're stop making it." <laughs> so, it didn't work. <laughs> it was great. People loved it. That well, I know, but I mean, it didn't work to quit making the label. I didn't I retire. No. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't quite got there yet. No. no. So now we're building a place over at the beach in Neat Tarts. And, uh, it's only an hour and 15 minutes, so we can live over there and commute back and forth from my, from my wines that I make and the Adia label. And with good tenants like Kelly and Tebow, it's really simple. They are they're, uh, uh, don't have to babysit anybody anymore, so it's really nice. Yeah, I don't know if that needs to be in there or not. <laughs> you mentioned kind of getting bitten by the bug by, by Pinot yeah. Noir. Tell me what's what's special about Oregon Pinot Noir to you, and what's maybe special about the Pinot Noir you're making? Special Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir. It it, it goes with everything. It it doesn't. Um, I mean, like a a big heavy cab is gonna. I mean, that almost is your meal. Where a Pinot Noir just makes the meal better. Yeah, it just pairs with and everything. It's just a beautiful wine. It's hard to describe what grabs you about Pinot Noir, and it's so different. And same fruit or same vineyard and different hands making the wines, and they'll be so different. Um, it just it just is captured by the maker who's producing. It. I don't know. That's we both have cellar palate. <laughs> <laughs> we drink a lot of our own wine. But, uh, yes. I don't know. We drink a lot of other wines too, but but uh, we kind of like ours. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, it's 
and different that you know you, you pull fruit from the Shehalem or from Dundee at that red dirt out of the Dundee Hills uh, it's got a whole different flavor profile Shehalem does mm -hmm. our vineyard is very unique and it's it's a east facing animal and it and it's so it's, it's usually the last fruit that comes in mm -hmm. and we even though we crop the yields are real low they it still takes a while and we're typically 10th of October before we're picking our vineyard mm -hmm. where other vineyards I'm almost done you know fermenting by then but on some some occasions mm -hmm. but uh, it's 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 its own thing you know it really is it's just a beautiful little vineyard mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's small enough. enough that you can actually we could actually pick it ourselves yeah, which we have done although a couple of years ago, I said I'd had enough. <laughs> so we let. Could. But we, could. Yeah, we, we could. could. Um, we Something used to. Could we did that. many yeah. years. We did. We did do it, and um, we had neighbors who would come and help, and it wouldn't take very long. And then the uh, Portland Community College had a uh, wine appreciation class on mm -hmm. some Saturdays, yeah. and Vicky did they that, came yeah. and picked our vineyard. Uh, probably four or five years at least there would be about 20 and they'd be done in almost an hour <laughs> done where when we were doing it it would take all day <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but and it was so, a lot of fun when the group come and then one year and yeah, yeah we gave them i mean we showed them let them even see what happened to the grapes after they yeah. picked them and, Some of the uh, students would hang out mm -hmm. and stay through the whole process, help all the sorting and so forth. And we'd we'd break out a table and throw a bunch of cheese and wines out there and have, just have a good old time um, with it. And it was a lot of lot of fun. Uh, in 2002, I think it was, didn't that we did the 23 hand cuvee? I don't think it was. Yes. The the class decided that they wanted to uh, make a barrel of wine. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we made a barrel of wine for the class. We kept it separate. And they actually came out to help bottle it. And the reason we call it 23 hand cubate because one of the students only had one arm. Right? So it was 23 they hands. Came, they came up with that. We yeah, didn't they do that. So we, did, we did a private custom label for them. Uh, for, and, for, and, a, and a barrel of wine. 20, 24 cases of wine. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah. It's been, it's been a... Uh, uh, a nice journey. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about uh, a couple of things from the kind of the early days. Uh, you obviously you came into the Oregon wine industry and it's still infancy, mm -hmm. uh, and you're working with a lot of the, the, the kind of the early names in it. So tell me about sort of your introduction to the industry and what what it, what it appeared to be as you were getting to know Dick Ponzi and Michael Etzel and people like that. It was a family. Yeah, family. Close ties. Everybody helps everybody. <laughs> we had a. Uh, well, know. you would get together and uh, talk about and the wines. And at different when it was time to to put the blends together for the different bottlings that whoever and there was always m more than just us involved. There would be well, like in Thomas Batchelder, remember you? Mm -hmm. We'd get together over at Lemelson's and and uh, Brian from Bell. Uh, Bell Pont. Bell Pont would be there, and, and of course, a whole bunch of us people would come in. We'd all set the table and drink the wines, taste the wines, and talk about who, what we were putting together, who was, who was doing what. It's very similar, a lot of things like that with Steamboat, you know, was another one that would, was uh, a big deal for us. Uh, would like to go up to Steamboat and, uh, and talk about all the wines and, and taste people's wines and, and what they were doing. Yeah, IPNC is always a lot of fun. Um, ready for a beer at the end of that? <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Yes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we haven't done one for a few years now, but we've done quite a few of them. Yes. But uh, yeah, I. Uh, Tell me about the process of learning to make wine and learning the vineyard, learning all of that from without the kind of the background. Well, I, I personally was very fortunate um, in that 
you know, I got to work with uh, people like Eric Homaker and Mike Edsel and, and uh, Thomas Batchelder and Dick Ponzi. Uh, Dick Ponzi and Dick Eraff and, you know, um, it 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 was a journey that was worth every bit of it, um, and all guys that uh, are involved. I mean, when when we were at uh, Limelson's, we were there for three years, um, and Bergson. That's when Josh first started making wine. It was under Eric Pomaker's uh, really deal, yeah, uh, and uh, and who else was there? Witness Street. Not, no, not Wizard Street. Uh, Winters, Winters Hill. Hill. Winters Hill. Uh, Russell. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where he met Delphine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, so a really tight community. Mm -hmm. We had, I remember one year, well, it was what, uh, 2002? I don't know. What are you going to say? <laughs> when, when the, when the uh, Eric calls me up, uh, Lemelson calls me up. Oh, yes. In a frantic uh, thing. It's harvest time. It's got 10 tons of fruit sitting on the deck. They were lit in the, you know the Enterprise. Have you seen the Enterprise? Okay. So the, they had the, the uh, destemmer on a cable and it pulled it up into place and you'd pin it, <laughs> right? And you'd lower it down to clean it and so forth. They were raising it up one time and the cable snapped. Oh. And it fell to the ground. And that's a pretty good fall. Yeah. Uh, and just bent the frame, um, tweaked it out, and just totally out of shape. Well, apparently, when, um, well, this was Bill Kelly had ordered uh, a, a D2. For Evan, Elvin Glade. For Evan Glade. Elvin Glade. And uh, it, in the process of coming over on the ship, it got um, salt water in all the electronics, right? They, something happened and so the electronics were shot so the the folks asked me if I would fix it for them mm -hmm. and um, I had it set here waiting for the parts to come when Eric's went down so we took all the electronics out of it and put them in this one <laughs> that came over because they sent Bill a new one <laughs> we put it together and we had him back up in line in six hours. That's amazing. See, that's the kind of camaraderie that you see. We had, we loaned ours one year when we didn't need it. We loaned it to the Colmans. And to Belpont. And to Belpont. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Brian bought it one year too. But mm -hmm. uh, but in the, in the it's like fixing thing. We I've built so many sorting lines now uh, in the valley. It's it's. Uh, it's pretty interesting to, to uh, cause I've got to meet all these guys. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, some, some really down to earth people, some people out there. <laughs> yeah. We've got a huge mix <laughs> in the fold here, but, uh, but I guess that's what makes it interesting. But uh, most of the, most of the people that I worked with were really down to earth, salt of the earth type of people. You mentioned earlier the, the name IDEA being an acronym for the family, and mm -hmm. of course your family is pretty heavily involved in this. So tell me about what it's like having a family business like this and the, and the advantages and perhaps challenges of that. Oh, family and business are always a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, Erica is still, she is a winemaker, and she consults with Bells Up, and... Um, she does work for us, too. And she works oh. with us. And is working with Kelly. Yeah. And um, Adam helped with Harvest a number of years, and yeah. and he was at University of Oregon and kind of found better things to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he's he's down with Nike. He's working with Nike. He's an IT guy for Nike. Yeah. Yeah, but it's yes, I think family and business. There are some families who can do that, and like Ponzi's. Um, they've been successful. I, yeah, you they've been successful. Been and we've, ours were, <laughs> Eric has got too many other 
irons in the fire to pay the attention that Dean likes to have. Paid to, to uh, uh, as far as the wines right now. <laughs> but you, we have five grandchildren, uh, or four. Yeah, I was gonna say. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, and they range from seventeen to five, right? So they're, and they're all Erica's, an so she's totally. But yeah. she's taken on quilting and winemaking and yeah. softball coaching and. Yeah. She's a busy, busy girl. Yes. <laughs> That's kind of one of the reasons that we. have back down a little bit in our production we you know one time we were I was having to travel all over the states uh, selling wine and <laughs> working with distributors and, and we just decided enough of that but because uh, you're a little guy you know it, the the as our industry has grown and people are producing a lot more wine uh, and and the big fish have come in uh, and they can push and force just like Budweiser can on the beer side, they push, make it, their wines are right, the ones being pushed. And so as a small producer and uh, small allotments for people, you gotta get swept under the rug a little bit. It's just a lot more work, which I didn't want to do anymore. So, But we, we like the wine club, the way we're set up right now. It's just our wine club, and we have a very good following. And, uh, and and meeting new people here at the bar, but we're open by appointment, so um, anymore. And uh, and we like that, that side of it too, because the people who come are generally interested in wine, mm -hmm. right? They want to learn about it, they want to know what, what happened, how, it, how we got there, what we're doing, so. And a lot of them become wine club members, mm -hmm. so. Tell me about building that following, about about having how, how people found you, uh, especially in the early days. This isn't exactly a main street out here. Well, yeah, this is not really fair. It is kind of a main street, but <laughs> kind of off the beaten path a little way. So how did, how did you build that following in the early days? You know, a lot of it was, uh, you know, when we used to do, well, we, you know, the IPNC and so forth, you meet people there. Sure. And, and uh, um, but a lot of it was word of mouth. Uh, folks that had tried wines. Funny enough, we had a lot of folks come out of Texas that just came out and, and came here one time and now have been members of our club for 10 years. There know. is a couple of, of tour, tour guys, guys help too. that um, really like to have their people go to some of the out of the way places and um, they had some really good clients with them and and they would always call and and bring people here yeah. um, so that that was a big part of it but somebody would come by and have a great experience and then then they'd be calling and bringing mm -hmm. two other family members or whatever right. and um, it just kind of went on we we didn't jump into the wine club deal right off the bat it was more um, just being open ever so often and and then when we were open on uh, when we had five or six other labels here and then we'd be open over Memorial weekend or Thanksgiving weekend and all six people would be pouring mm -hmm. and um, so we some of our people would find new a new winery and their people would come and find us and and so it was those were the really big um, times when we met a lot of people yeah. and um, that was a, a, a growing experience for everyone involved mm -hmm. it was a win-win for all of us um, that Pete and, and every time we had somebody new here would bring their groups into it to taste and and they get to experience a whole bunch of different wines. Sometimes we have 25 wines, you know, in the tasting. Um, so you've got a little bit of everything, you know. And people go through and they try all the whites and then they go back through and try it. But they, they got to experience different vineyards, different soils, different winemakers, uh, all in one location. So it, it really worked well for, uh, for exposure for all of us. 
kind of that camaraderie thing again. You know, you get back into that where everybody's working together. Right. Instead of uh, trying to keep people to themselves, they would share, you know, and so it was a, uh, a good experience. The Oregon way, if you will. Sure. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. So Ann, you, you have the you have the business background here. So tell me about uh, sort of implementing that into a small family winery and how you have helped it grow. Helped it grow. Uh, I don't know. Um, I just I worked at a financial. I was in the banking part of the trust company. So um, Joe. <laughs> It just was it like when Dean had aerial equipment. I did the books for that, and it was. Then I had to learn all the things that we needed to do to stay in compliance and paperwork and that. And I, I've, I've just done that. And uh, mm, we send out a few newsletters, not very many, because I don't. I never think I'm going to say the right thing. <laughs> Or have enough to say, and uh, so we just we do the wine club in house and keep it to a under 150 and and so that it's manageable. Was there anything unexpected about having a wine business? You talk about the paperwork, and we've heard a lot about paperwork over the years. Was there anything unexpected about that? No, I don't think so. It the the worst part, I think, of the whole paperwork is that every state has a different rule. It's like they want to outdo their neighbor with something more <laughs> crazy to ask for. And um, if, oh, if there was some way that they all the states a, didn't have, a, yeah. you know, it could be something a federal thing instead well, of... Well, yeah, but I don't think you want that. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> That's true. I mean, the, fe yeah. the federal's part of it, too, yeah. but um, yeah. not but so paperwork. But we're, we're small enough that, that that there's... that the paperwork is, I'm sure, just minuscule compared to <laughs> a winery of, of a much larger size. So you've talked a little bit about this already, but I'm curious, um, the, the sort of the major changes you've seen in the industry since you became part of it. You're looking at almost 30 years now in the industry. So what are the, what, besides just pure size, what are the other changes you've noticed about, or, about the Oregon wine industry? Well, yeah, I, I think the same concern we had back then, we still have now, mm -hmm. uh, some of us anyway. Um, the problem that I see is that we work so hard to build the Oregon brand, right, mm -hmm. of quality and so forth, and um, and it's changing. The, the mass production of, of Pinot Noir, um, it's, I don't think it's changing for the better. Um, there's so many labels out there with, that are just non-interesting wines. I mean, they're just not what they should be. Uh, it's not what Pinot tastes like. What? Yeah, I don't know if that should be on, on record for you saying Well, I can say that because I feel that way. But, okay. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's unbelievable what they're offering as Willamette Valley uh, Pinot Noir. And uh, so, I mean, there's, there's some uh, of some. There's a lot of really focused people <laughs> making really good wines. The, the problem is is that the ones that are being shown all over the country don't represent these people. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's a big concern. Is that just because it says Willamette Valley on it doesn't mean it's good doesn't mean it's what Oregon is all about and uh, I don't know it's 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 interesting but there's a lot of really good producers still that are focused and still trying to do a good job even though they're making a lot more wine than they used to uh, they say it can be done you just gotta want to do it 
do you still see the same kind of camaraderie that you, you talked about in the, in the earlier days? On a much smaller scale. It's still the old, the, the friends have been friends for a lot of years, mm -hmm. a lot of years. But everybody gets, you know, it going in so many directions as families grow and so then you have your own family and and it's hard to to get together as often as mm -hmm. as, as we, we did yeah. yeah we used to get together a lot yeah more than we do now mm -hmm. but everybody you know, like I say yeah, exactly what Ann said you know families grow the kids are have kids and you know, and everything kind of is and it's just what happens plus Every, you get old and you slow down you get old and you slow down <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. Don't don't uh, party quite like we used to. <laughs> that would be the appropriate thing to say. Right. Yeah. You've told some some fun stories already, but I'm curious if you have a, sort of a favorite memory or, or favorite time of your of your wine journey. Is there a favorite something you look back on with with most fondness? <laughs> so much to remember. Oh my God. Um, yeah. I, I I still I still come back to when we were planting. Uh, the dynamite block up at uh, that it borders Whistling Ridge and Burrow Fair. Mm -hmm. Michael bought this block or had it. It was part of his place. We finally decided to plant it. It's right next to Dick and Patricia Alborns. Mm -hmm. And there were some big stumps in the uh, in the area where we had to get rid of them. And uh, and I had a dynamite license back then. I like where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, so we, uh, Mikey was there, the, all of Mike's boys were there. And well, they were all little. They were little like back then. This is what nine this was and going ten. On, 10 12, something like that. And so we were blasting these stumps. And uh, one particular one that we let off, uh, might have got a little bit carried away with, with the fertilizer. But uh, anyways, there's some big chunks flying out into the vineyard, into Dick Alborn's vineyard. <laughs> he was out there he working. He was on a tractor. He was on a tractor. <laughs> and he comes out of there and goes, oh, I hope you've got good insurance. <laughs> <laughs> At Michael. Because <laughs> we were blasting and stuff was flying everywhere. You know? But yeah, we, we just a lot of times like that, you know, when you just, just Doing life, mm -hmm. you know, that's what it was all about, just doing our thing. But uh, that was one of my favorite ones. <laughs> I can still, I can still see the expression on his face. That many years ago, too. Yes, yes. Yeah. He was probably in his seventies, and he's ninety-three yeah. or four now. Yeah. What do you what do you see? You've mentioned some concerns about the Oregon industry. What do, what do you guys see as you look ahead to Oregon wine? What is Oregon wine going to look like in a, in a decade? California. Yeah. 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 How do you mean? Well, I just it's it's grown so fast and it's so competitive anymore. Um, where before uh, we had competition but it was good competition it was a different kind of a thing and I was trying to shove everybody else out and, you know we, we saw it happening early on uh, when uh, a big winery would come in and buy up contracts from people right mm -hmm. uh, and then as soon as their vineyards came online they would uh, cancel that and then the grower that, that had gone with a particular one and it's had to go back and try to get the people that he was working with for years on a handshake and uh, uh, of course you're really reluctant to do that after you've been burnt like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. but you you establish that especially when you're doing single vineyard stuff and you're you know I mean you're working on as a team the fruit is there the you know it, it's it's promoting their terroir their their hard labor and you're producing your wines uh, in a certain fashion and it kind of gets lost when, when that kind of thing happens. But I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? I think the, the industry is growing. It's becoming stronger, but it is it's getting 
kind of blurry. Mm -hmm. So, not quite as focused. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that, Anne? Do you have any cons I concerns as you look ahead? I happened to be looking at Facebook the other day, and um, Josh Bergstrom posted a, a picture of a, a Christum 2011 Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. And to hear him talking or feeling like he had the privilege to still know these, some of these early, early days wineries and, and be able to post that, yeah, he's a winemaker, blah, 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 but he's drinking mm -hmm. this other wine that was showing so beautifully. I can't remember. I was going to see if I could even find the words. I mean, yeah, he just really boring. put it into a, it was a good good thought. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I won't be able to find it, <laughs> but it was it was a beautiful thing that he said about the industry as a family mm -hmm. and um, the fact that you could admire another member of that family's work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very Friend, friendly competition. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. right. And I, I do think some of that is, is getting lost. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, there are some... Well, still a small group. You've talked about slowing down a bit here. What are you looking at? What do you see as you look ahead for, for Adia? Well, I think that I, I, I'm pretty confident that Erica will probably carry on um, the whole thing. As, as her kids grow and the, the boys are in the uh, ocean's a, a senior in high school now and Forrest is a year behind and, and Alfred's now in school so uh, and Catula's uh, pretty well you know she's on her way as far as uh, being able to take care of uh, even helping with Alistair mm -hmm. quite a bit and so on. So she'll have more time and I think she probably will. And it's kind of up to her what she wants to do with the idea label um, in that respect. Um, you know, we, we I, I personally will still be uh, making wine as long as I possibly can while well, I physically can do it. Um, I enjoy it. I enjoy making wine. Selling it's a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I enjoy having people come in and, and spend an afternoon and talk about wines and what we're doing. And, and uh, uh, But when people like what you're doing, and uh, it's really uh, heartwarming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as Adia, uh, you know, Kelly's kind of, Kelly's here now and she, you know, she's, Ten years younger than I am, or more. I shouldn't say what. Yes. And uh, and and Tivo will be here until he starts his own winery. And mm -hmm. so, uh, with Erica doing her thing and she's doing consulting work, we got people who call all the time wanting us to make wine for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure she'll probably pick up a custom crush client or two and 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 continue doing what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've always done, for the last 20 years, I've done uh, share crop with people uh, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. The Mora family, uh, they helped me uh, plant my vineyard. You know, they, I've known those guys for 30 years. Uh, and they consult and they uh, manage vineyards. And a lot of vineyards that they planted, the, the folks now are reaching the age where they don't want to have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, only in and Valentine are carrying or leasing the vineyards and selling the fruit and, and taking care of the vineyards. And uh, so that's turned into a really uh, a good long-term thing. So we do a, 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 a Mora family vineyard uh, uh, label uh, under Adia. Uh, they don't have a license and so forth. So, you know, but we just like I would do a cherry grove or a hawk mm -hmm. vineyard and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that's helping them to build their situation, so that someday they'll they'll want to do their thing too. So, uh, good people, hardworking. So, um, yeah. Can I pause here for just one second.
Yeah. Have fun. Get beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Anne. These people get trimmed up. <laughs> he, he finally got his hair to grow back to shave him to do it. <laughs> Sir, treat his hair is finally growing back. But, uh, we're going to try to even it out now. <laughs> well, I've gone through all the questions that I have for you. Um, is there anything I should have asked that I didn't? Anything we didn't cover that we should have covered? Oh, I'm sure there's a lot of stories that could be told. Uh, <laughs> of course. There's a lot of things that could be said, but, uh, you know, all in all, Oregon, hopefully, Oregon will always be Oregon. You know, I mean, as far as the type of people and the, and the way people think um, here, uh, and there's such a good group in in the wine industry, um, and, I, and I hope it always will be that way. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today, for your hospitality, and oh, uh, absolutely. Well, go ahead and let you off the hook here. Yeah.